This program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with the City of Eau Claire. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Um, and there's some details here real quick. Uh, so this meeting is broadcast live by Valley Media Works on Charter Channel 994 101.9 FM and online at valleymediaworks.org. The Plan Commission attempts to conduct its public hearings in a relatively informal manner within the constraints that we must deal with the issues before us in an orderly and business-like fashion. We give the applicant an opportunity to speak first and then others, either for or against the proposal, are each uh, given an opportunity to speak once. <clears throat> we do request that everyone restrict their comments to the issues before us, avoid unnecessary repetition, and please be prudent with the use of time. We want to be sure that we adequately um, provide a review for all items with equal diligence. A um, couple points of reminder, uh, please turn uh, phones off or to silent. Um, we do have uh, yellow slips in the back. If anybody would like to speak tonight, we'd ask that they fill them out and leave them on the counter for Ryan. Um, if you do speak tonight, please introduce yourself with your name and address. And uh, I guess with that, we'll get to our first item tonight. We have a public hearing uh, for approval. Um, conditional use permit for home occupants, uh, home occupation, sorry, at uh, 1421 Cameron Street. Mr. Petrie. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, before you is a public hearing for approval by the Plan Commission tonight, requesting a conditional use permit, like Mr. Redball said, 1421 Cameron Street. The property is located uh, along Cameron, uh, just to the north of the cemetery that the city owns. Uh, here's the aerial photograph of the property. It's adjacent to a church to the west, single family to the north, single family to the east, and then the community-owned uh, cemetery church or cemetery park open space. In your packet too is a notification map. We notify within 300 feet of the property. Uh, this was also published in the paper twice, and a sign was placed on the property that has been disappeared because of the snow. Uh, with that being said, the property is currently zoned R1, single family, along with the adjacent properties. Uh, the property owner is requesting a home occupation uh, for a hair salon. This proposed home occupation would be consist of a single chair uh, hair salon service for one client at a time. Uh, the home occupation would be Monday through Saturday, around 30 hours maximum. Typical hours would be 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, the hair salon will take up about 200 square feet of the home uh, and is enclosed within the home. Cameron Street is a principal arterial. Uh, the property does allow, uh, does have on-street parking along with bike lanes. Uh, if you look at this uh, aerial, uh, their detached garage is here. They do have a long driveway off the street. Would be adequate parking for their clients. Uh, Typically, these uh, home occupations that have been re reviewed by the Plan Commission are scheduled by clients on a regular hour basis or half an hour basis, depending on the occupation. Uh, the sign that was proposed would be one square feet in area, uh, must be on the wall of the building or dwelling. Uh, also, must contain only the name of the owner and the home occupation. The rear criteria are noted in your packet for home occupations. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And the applicant is uh, in the audience for questions as well. Great. Uh, thanks. Any questions? Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Petrie, if I recall correctly, we approved a, something, a request similar to this within the last six months, I believe. Uh, within the last salon. year. It was last within year. the last year. Correct. Okay. Yep. Uh, yes. Similar home occupation. It was for a hair salon. That's what uh, We don't get that many complaints, but if we do, we would investigate. Mm -hmm. uh, in this situation, I don't see it being an issue, but right. you just never know. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Larson. Thank you. Did you receive any feedback from the neighborhood? Uh, we did not. Uh, so we notified the, the map here, uh, also in the paper, and then the sign would be placed on the property. We have not heard from anyone. Uh, at this time, and there might be somebody in the audience that is a neighbor, but. All right, thank you. Okay, any additional questions <clears throat> for Ryan? All right, I don't see any, thank you. Is the applicant here? 
You want to come up? Hello, uh, my name is sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. My name is Stephanie Stanley. I am recently just purchased the home on 1421 Cameron Street with my husband. He pretty much said everything I was going to say to you, but I appreciate all of you guys sitting here and listening to my request. And that's all I have to say. Any questions for the applicant? Um, good question. Have you heard anything from any of your neighbors? I haven't heard anything from the neighbors. My in-laws actually owned the house previously, and then my father-in-law is the pastor of the church right next to the home. So I think my father-in-law has mentioned things to neighbors, but I haven't heard anything from them. Okay, appreciate it. Yep. All right, thanks. Um, I guess if, if you want to have a seat, we'll, we'll open it up for discussion, and then if we have any more questions, call Jack. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Um, this is a, uh, a public hearing, so if there's anybody here that'd like to discuss the item, now is your opportunity. Anybody here would like to discuss it? I'm not seeing anybody, so I guess we'd we'll be looking for a motion. Greg? I'll move approval. And a motion? Second. And a second by Greg. Um, so, discussion. Any, let's call the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations, good luck. Right, approved. So, um, next item public discussion for approval site plan at 1020 Menominee Street. Dental, I believe. Feature. Thank you. Uh, item number two it's off of Menominee Street, off of uh, Claremont Avenue on the west side of town, west of Water Street. Property currently uh, has the Menominee Street Dental. They're looking to expand their parking lot for employees. The property is currently zoned C2P uh, for the dental office there. Every day surveying and engineering is the applicant on behalf of the owners. Uh, in your packet is the site plan showing the existing building, the modification to the west parking lot here, and then the addition of the east parking lot here. Also in your packet is the landscape plan. Uh, the aerial photograph will show it, but uh, the property to the north is zoned residential, so they do need to provide some kind of screening, which they is noted here. They are adding some screening along the sidewalk along Menominee Street, and then they're doing some modifications to the building, adding an entrance here for the employees, and adding some more landscaping and modifying the building accordingly. The reason why this is a site plan review is because they're adding more stalls, uh, more than five stalls to the site. Uh, the narrative explains the project consisting minor arterial, uh, minor, uh, arc, arc, ugh, minor art relations to the existing building, modification to the existing parking lot, and the addition of the new parking lot, like I mentioned. Uh, the landscape plan does show a mixture of existing street trees, foundation plantings, and other plantings. Uh, currently, Menominee Street Dental has 30 employees. Uh, the remaining stalls would be for customers and future employees. The total number of stalls is 94 provided on site. The proposed okay. lighting for the project appears to be in compliance. Um, it was noted that a pedestrian link should be added to the approval letter. Uh, that it, uh, The applicant is here. He may want to touch base on that, but the entrance door... Oops, Entrance door for their customers would be in this location. Uh, this is a new site plan, so we would require that, and that will be added to the letter. Uh, in your packet, too, is the grading and drainage of the site, public utilities, traffic, and transit, along with the building elevations that were provided by the applicant. Uh, the only other condition that staff would add would be the approval of the grading and drainage and then the adding of the bicycle racks per the, per the site requirements. With that, I would be happy to answer any questions. All right, any questions for Ryan? Ryan, you mentioned a pedestrian link. Is so something off of Menominee Street coming back along the drive? That is correct. Um, the site is significantly far off the road, but adequate sidewalk connection from the public sidewalk along Menominee Street to the front door. 
Now, that could be achieved. The applicant may want to touch base on that and see what he's thinking, but they are providing some si new sidewalk around the building, but they're not providing it to the public sidewalk. Any other questions, comments for Ryan? Thanks, I don't see any. Is the applicant here? Want to come up? I'm Dan Knowlton from Everyday Surveying and Engineering. Uh, the applicant, actual dental office people are not here, I guess. Um, so, um, Ryan had mentioned a, a pedestrian link from Menominee Street. Is that something you guys have thought about? Or? No, um, not at all. But if it has to be done, we can do it. It looks like it would be best on the east entrance there rather than the longer, the one that's not being touched, you know. Sure. Yeah. Did, okay, I'll open up for anybody else have a question for applicant? Yeah, Jeremy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I was wondering, I know there's an existing building that is at least partially residential toward the back of the property there. Um, <coughs> and there is a sidewalk that leads from but I guess our proposed six parking stalls. I guess I was wondering if you thought about having one of those stalls not be uh, a parking spot so that people could access that building easier uh, from the sidewalk. Um, where is that? Here. It's on the north northwest of the site plan there. There's an existing building that is indicated and then there's six parking stalls like right in front of it. Oh, that building. Okay. I was looking at the apartment here. Yeah. I guess my question would be given that there's a residential building that, that uh, has a sidewalk leading to the parking lot. If someone were parked in the, in the parking spot in front of that sidewalk, they might not be able to access the building. Okay, right in the south side there. <coughs> yeah. Um, I have no. I think there's. Is there two units in that building, Ryan? No. I think there are two. I've been in there. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, if you want us to do that, that's fine. Um, one less stall, but. Thank you. It, it can be done, I guess, if it needs to be. Any additional questions for applicant? I'm not seeing any. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thanks. Public discussion, right? Public discussion. Okay. Um, so this is public discussion. I guess we'd be looking for a motion at this point. So I'll, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion to um, to put this up for discussion, and but uh, I would like to include a a uh, I guess a, an, a condition of approval that would require a a way for people to to access the Menominee Street um, via sidewalk, as as noted by Mr. Petrie, and then also um, find a way to make sure that that sidewalk from the existing residential building in the back of the site plan would, would be able to not have a car parked in front of the sidewalk. It could, that may or may not mean taking away a, a parking spot depending on how they redesign it, but that would be my motion. Got a motion and looking for a second? I'll second it. Here? Okay, motion and second. So discussion. Do you have any concerns with the additions? All right, I'm not seeing any, so let's uh, call the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, great. Thanks. Congratulations. Um, item number three uh, public discussion for approval. Uh,
3115 Oak Knoll Drive, site plan. Let's start. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's down located on 93, uh, north of 94, on the east side of 93. Uh, this is the property. It used to be the former RV sales, U.S. RVs. It's been vacant for some time. Um, Vance Engineering Concept is the applicant on behalf of the property owner. Uh, this would be the future home of Eau Claire Head Start. Current zoning of the property is C3. Uh, in your packet is the site plan, uh, noted building elevations, grading and drainage, traffic, parking, landscape. Landscaping. The site plan shows the removal of the existing asphalt and adding a 10,400 square foot building. The narrative does not match the description. Uh, the reason being is we've, we, we saw a revised plan coming to us on Friday. So the narrative that was provided by the applicant is a, a little different. They did add a, a little more square footage to the building on the east side. I would note the, the driveway is a shared driveway with the applicant and the property owner to the south. They are coming around and then down, going the opposite way through the site and then back out to the Oak Knoll Drive. The reason why that is, uh, Head Start is for uh, lower income uh, th third and fourth graders, or third and three year olds and four year olds, kindergarten teaching, and this would be for buses. So the bus would come around, stop at the front door, let the kids off, proceed out to the road. Now the employees would do the same thing, but they would park here or here. But the, the reason why they designed it that way was for the bus services and the drop off for the, for the children at that site. Uh, the site plan and the floor plan are noted. Uh, there are some modifications that have, have occurred. Uh, again, I mentioned they did add a little more square footage to the site. The applicant is in the audience if there's any questions regarding that. Again, a pedestrian link is required from the, the, the door to the sidewalk, public sidewalk. Uh, they do note a landscape mixed of trees and shrubs along uh, 93 and foundation plantings. The proposed lighting is consistent with the city standards. The facility has 28 stalls. My understanding is there would be 22 employees on the facility or at the facility. Uh, again, bicycle parking shall be added to the site. Grading and drainage is noted in the report along with public utilities, traffic and transit. Um, again, some conditions that need to be met before getting a building permit, grading and drainage approval, the adding of bicycle racks and pedestrian link and um, exterior lighting. Um, meeting the city standards. Building elevation for the site. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Right, any questions for Mr. Petrie? No, thanks. Is the applicant here? Uh, good evening. My name is Sean Bohan, 401 Pinnacle Way, uh, Eau Claire. Um, I'm an engineer with Advanced Engineering Concepts. We're here uh, representing um, our client and the developer. Um, at this time, uh, uh, the developer doesn't have any um, concerns or questions in regards to um, the conditions placed on it. Um, one thing to note, however, is it's not a shared driveway. The, uh, the other business has another access into the site. Um, so this will specifically be used for the Head Start building. Um, and I guess with that, I'll go ahead and answer any engineering questions if you guys have any. Good. Any questions? Uh, quiet. Yeah. All right. I'm not seeing any. Um, is the applicant here or is it just your shop? It's uh, just us and the developers here also. Okay. Um, don't have any questions, so okay. appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, again, this is another public uh, discussion item, so we'd be looking for a motion at this point. 
I move to approve with staff recommendations. For a second? Second. All right, I got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Not seeing it. Let's call the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, great. Good luck. <coughs> Takes us to discussion and direction. We got a landmark. Landmarks designation for 618 South Farwell. <coughs> Good evening. The uh, uh, Landmarks Commission has been contacted by the owners of uh, 618 South Farwell Street. Uh, requesting consideration for designating the property as, as a local landmark uh, property. The building was built in, in 1905. Uh, it's a Queen Anne style uh, structure. It's located as shown here on, on Farwell Street at the corner of uh, Seaver and, and Farwell. Uh, this location here is a uh, photograph of the house. It actually uh, has apartments up on the upper floors. Uh, the first floor is, a, uh, is an art gallery uh, called the uh, Gallaudet Art Gallery. It's owned by uh, Michael and Vicki uh, Maluski. The uh, house, as I mentioned, was built in 1905 by A.E. Uh, White. Uh, White uh, owned and operated the uh, white machine works uh, back at that time and employed a, a fairly large number of people. Uh, there's some discrepancies in the in the history regarding the uh, the size of the white machine works, but it was uh, in, in the hundreds of people it, uh, during it, during its heyday. Uh, the commission landmark commission has looked at this on a preliminary basis and they feel that it uh, uh, meets the criteria both for architecture and possibly for history uh, based on the on the house as uh, as white uh, not only owned a fairly large business within the city but he also uh, was uh, quite an inventor and uh, over the course of his uh, inventing uh, time he he holds over 10 uh, different patents with the US patent uh, agency uh, as part of the requirement for the landmark designation of these uh, considerations, uh, we have to notify the different uh, uh, departments within the city and also uh, the plan commission. Basically, the plan commission's role is to see whether it is uh, conforming with the comprehensive plan or conflicts with any neighborhood or area plans at all. Uh, with our review of this, uh, we don't feel that there are any conflicts, but we uh, are required to bring this through the Planning Commission for, for any comment. With that, if you have any questions. Great, thanks Pat. Any questions for Pat? Comments? Not seeing any. Um, so is this something where we make a motion or? Uh, the Commission can in the past uh, generally if, uh, there seems like a consensus that it's okay. Uh, we ha haven't made a motion. So either way. Seems like someone should support the motion. Yeah, Greg. I'd like to propose a motion to support the amendment, to support the application. Sounds good. Yeah. Second? Yeah. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye, great. Thanks, Pat. Um, next, we've got... Uh, we got our zoning change consideration, 111 Niagara Street. Oh, Pat as well. Welcome back. <clears throat> the uh, Randall Park Neighborhood Association has uh, for a number of years, years been interested in trying to uh, improve the appearance of this uh, parcel here. This is a city-owned parcel. 
uh, was acquired uh, by the city back in 1997 as part of the FEMA uh, program. Uh, it's, it's, it's within the floodplain, and uh, when the city had uh, availability of, of FEMA funds, we purchased it back at that time, uh, cleared the houses that was on it, and basically has sat pretty much as a, as a vacant lot uh, since that, that time. Uh, the neighborhood plan identified uh, this parcel as, is, uh, in terms of that the neighborhood would, would like to try to do something with it just to try to improve the appearance of that. Uh, because it was purchased with FEMA funds, the restrictions on that are quite uh, quite severe in terms of we really can't put any kind of building uh, or structures on that. So it's quite limited what we can do and we can't even do much for, for pavement on there. Uh, but what the neighborhood is looking at doing is they've uh, been working with the group and trying to uh, possibly do some landscaping on, on the property and then also uh, make the area available for uh, some yard games such as coob or bocce ball and those types of things. The, uh, they've at this point just submitted a very preliminary drawing in, in terms of what they would be looking at doing would be in this area here they would be doing uh, kind of a minimal area of, of plantings which would be a combination of some shrubs and trees and, and flowers and those types of things. If they get the go ahead from the city, uh, then they would be working with some of the local gardener groups and comes up with a more of a specific uh, plan uh, for the plantings. And then in this area here, this would be available for uh, some of the, the yard games and things like that. Uh, the Waterways and Parks Commission talked about this last week at their meeting. They also suggest the possibility of uh, uh, some minimal signage in terms of uh, recognizing that it is a public space and that it is available <coughs> for the public public to use. Uh, since the neighborhood brought this forward, uh, in, are looking at this, the property currently is zoned uh, mixed residential and that dates back to the days uh, before 1997 when there were uh, rental properties on, on this. Uh, since the city does own it now, it would make sense that we would uh, go through the process of rezoning it to be public. Uh, what we would like to do tonight is get that authorization from the plan commission to go ahead and start the public hearing process and get the notices out uh, so that we would rezone it to be public. So that would come back to you probably at our April meeting, but we wanted to get that authorization from you. Also at that time, if we did go forward, uh, what we would do as part of our parks planning is we would uh, identify or classify this parcel as part of our park system. Right now it's, it's just out there as a vacant lot and what we'll do is we'll incorporate it into one of our classifications in our five-year plan. So that would be part of your review when we come back with the rezoning. Uh, so tonight, till tonight we're just looking for uh, uh, direction from you that we can go ahead and, and start the process to rezone the property. Sounds great. Thanks, Pat. Any questions? Uh, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ivory, I was wondering um, if part of this effort we could address the fact that there's around 10 parking spaces on the property that is public land. I guess it's not zoned officially public yet, but um, apparently from the um, there's some carryover parking from those apartments that, that appears to using the spaces off the alley there or what I think that's an alley at least mm -hmm. is there is there a way we could address that issue as part of this effort yeah actually uh, we would we would uh, research uh, the, the use of those that that parking we would do that separately from the from the zoning uh, so it wouldn't necessarily be a requirement one way or the other of the zoning, but uh, we'll research in terms of the the history in terms of the, those cars parking in that area and referring to the right in this area here. Uh, I did pull a photo uh, actually back from 1997, uh, and that would have been at the time that the city acquired the properties, and it showed that the, this parking did exist back at that time. So I'm, we're assuming that it's a carryover uh, from back at that time. Uh, we can do some research to see if there's any 
kind of agreement uh, between uh, the, the landlord and the city, but for, uh, on a preliminary basis, we have not found any formal or informal agreement, just that that parking has continued to occur. Uh, and it, the one advantage is it does get some of the cars off the, uh, off the streets at that point, but we can uh, take a further look at that. Uh, Terry. In that, uh, we're possibly looking, or the neighborhood is looking at light recreational use in their cube or frisbees or throwing a football, whatever. It'd be nice if that parking could stay there for people using that rather than parking on the streets and maybe limit the hours that no parking between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. And that way it would be more prone for the, the people that are using that for recreational purposes. Again, delve into whatever agreements are there, but maybe mm -hmm. that's how we could reserve that parking for mm -hmm. people using the, the property then. Yeah, as part of the uh, the use agreement with the neighborhood, the city will enter into a MOU agreement in terms of the uh, landscaping and uh, different improvements that would occur there. So we can take a look at that as kind of that parking issue as part of that MOU. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Pat. What what is the parking surface where those cars are parked? Is it, it it's not a hard surface, is it? I'm not sure exactly. I've heard that it was is more of a, a gravel surface, uh, but I can't confirm that right now, and probably won't be able to for a month or so. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, but it, it's existing from the time that we bought it. So uh, before when the city bought it, so it it it, it is conforming. Uh, but we'd be limited in terms of what we could do to improve it. Uh, we basically need to just kind of keep what's there. Okay. Uh, one more, if I could. Oh, yeah, please. So if this becomes part of the city park system, would you have to name it then, or how do you handle that? It, Yes, we would have to come up with some kind of name. I think we'd probably look to the uh, the neighborhood initially for some suggestions. Uh, the the uh, community services department and the parks division has somewhat of a policy procedure for naming our park system. So we would uh, take a look at that and and go through that procedure and come come up with a name. Okay, so it, it would have its own identity separate from Owen Park? Yes, yes, it would be separate from Owen Park. Uh, we wouldn't want to call it the annex of Owen Park or something like that, but that's why we, uh, Parks and Waterways, felt it would be appropriate to have just some limited signage uh, to, <coughs> I, to identify it as a public space so that people can f feel free to use it. Right, right now, I think some people aren't aware of that and feel that maybe it's a private space and shouldn't be on there. So. Right. Okay, thank you. <coughs> James, did you have a name in mind? <laughs> Not right now, but I, I could come up with something. <laughs> yeah, something like that. A road name after So we would like a, a motion on, on us to go forward then. Any other questions? Yeah, so I guess You'd like a motion to recommend? Just to initiate the process. Initiate the process. Anybody, uh, Terry? Yeah, I'll make a motion that we uh, go forward and initiate the process to turn this into a more public land. Sounds great. Yeah, second? Terry? That includes the rezoning to public also. Um, re includes the rezoning? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. Is that a second? I'll second it. All right. Yeah. Motion, second. Any discussion? Yeah, Jeremy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I certainly agree that this uh, be good to move forward on. I, I recall that, I think it was maybe about six or seven years ago when there was exploration as to where a community garden uh, could go in the Randall Park neighborhood, that this was one of the locations that was considered uh, at that time, and ultimately Lakeshore Park was chosen, which I think was probably a better location. Um, but I guess I... I'd be curious as to whether the neighborhood would be interested in, a, in an additional community garden, especially since this is on the whole other side of the neighborhood. So I guess pretty open-minded about the possibilities, and I'm excited about it. Great. Okay. 
Any additional discussion? All right, I'm not seeing any. Um, let's uh, call the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thanks. Okay. Thanks. All right, that brings us to the update for uh, the Regional uh, Housing Task Force. Alan. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission. Uh, including your packet is uh, just a quick one page memo just to uh, get us uh, oriented on where we are with the uh, Chippewa Valley Regional Housing Task Force. Uh, I can, I'm going to walk through some of the, the history of the group and um, just to talk a little bit about the other attachment that was included in your agenda, which is the uh, list of uh, summary recommendations from the group. Uh, just uh, to kind of start at the end and work our way back a little bit, uh, the task force is looking to get together for uh, hopefully a final review and approval of uh, this, these materials as well as a longer report uh, looking to get together next week. So it's kind of a preview of uh, their final work and just uh, also a summary of what they worked on up to this point. This will be a little repeat for those of you who were at the uh, city council meetings and work session last week or watch them uh, either in person or online. So with that, uh, since June of last year, uh, cities of Altoona and Eau Claire have partnered to lead this regional housing task force. Let's see how these turn out here. Fair to middling, I can zoom out here a little bit. And just uh, just highlighting here the focus. So it started last June. Uh, you can kind of even back up a little bit before then. Kind of eight, March, April, May, kind of late spring, mid late spring. There's some discussions to to really get this kicked off. And so the first meeting is task force after uh, the group was assembled of about 40 people at the time uh, was to really uh, collaborate to better understand housing challenges, look at solutions, and uh, facilitate some additional cooperation. So essentially taking what's uh, been done. Uh, perhaps in different silos, as it were, and, and move forward to put together something a little bit more cohesive. Uh, with that, too, again, the purpose was identified to increase that collective understanding of the housing market conditions. So do a lot of data research and uh, look at uh, other factors and, again, uh, hopefully get some recommendations put together to share with uh, the regional uh, governing bodies. Overall goal statement was identified. This uh, was a lot of work to put this together. <laughs> Um, because in the end, we ended up with uh, almost 80 stakeholders as a part of this task force, which is a testament to the uh, quality of uh, input as well as the uh, uh, quality of the involvement in the community and the region uh, to really to focus in on uh, housing issues. <clears throat> kind of the first statement really sums it up in order to provide a fair and equitable access to safe, quality, healthy, stable housing for all individuals and families. So that's really the, the focus, which again, very aspirational, of course, as an overall goal statement. And they start looking at a little bit thing, things a little bit more in detail uh, moving forward. There's a second meeting, again, four in all. We'll have our fifth one here next week, as I mentioned. Uh, end of August, kind of alternated locations between Altoona and Eau Claire, although it did include, uh, again, we've had uh, county, uh, folks from county, from the Regional Planning Commission, from uh, you know, Chippewa and from Lake Halley as well. So folks from various uh, uh, other municipalities and uh, governance did attend and participate in this as well. So it's not, just, not exclusively Altoona and Eau Claire, but uh, we are kind of the uh, uh, co-leaders putting these uh, groups together. Uh, talk about Alice report. Uh, you may have heard of that, uh, asset limited uh, income constrained employed just makes for a nice uh, acronym but uh, the point being uh, those with uh, limited assets uh, constrained by income but are still employed so uh, finding ourselves you know folks not necessarily in uh, poverty I'll try to zoom in here a little bit uh, again kind of that middle middle area, the folks who are um, kind of above that threshold, those who are more uh, income secure, as we would call it. Uh, this, the darker blue is, uh, includes those who uh, are 
experiencing poverty at the moment, and then kind of that in between uh, uh, folks in that Alice threshold. So in Eau Claire itself, we find ourselves with uh, 46% if you include kind of both of those. And uh, this is uh, these are kind of countywide numbers. So for the city of Eau Claire, we find ourselves with Alice and poverty at uh, 46%. So these are the numbers that, that came out in uh, late August that we started to uh, talk about a little bit more with uh, with the task force, just looking at the fact that uh, we have, you know, if we're talking about housing, what other factors come into play with that? And I'll show a little bit more here with that. So looking at Eau Claire County specifically, we, we included numbers from uh, Dunn, Chippewa, and Eau Claire counties in our uh, data analysis, but uh, obviously really focused primarily on the Eau Claire County numbers. Uh, you can see here, uh, when you're a single adult in terms of what your costs are, certain things such as childcare and, and such are, and even uh, healthcare are a lot lower. So, you know, housing costs, you know, 466 a month is, you know, you're, you're doing pretty well and, uh, and I say well, but you're, you know, this is called survival budget. So anything 466 and lower is survivable and, and uh, manageable. Hourly wage at $10 an hour or less Again, this is minimum, so to speak. Uh, but once you start getting additional adults, additional uh, children in the mix, uh, housing costs start increasing. Childcare is almost double your housing costs. And all these other expenses just really start to eat away at that, uh, that income, con that's constrained income, that I see part of the ALICE acronym. And so even making $31 an hour is uh, is a is a struggle to make those things work. So, point being that it's not just housing costs, as you see here, being an issue, but all these other uh, ancillary costs that really speak into that uh, uh, being cost limit cost income constrained or or dealing with cost burdens. Zoom out a little bit with this one again. I don't want to get too buried in the data. Uh, but just to give you a little bit of snapshot of what we've been looking at, we have, I think it's uh, 50 pages of data right now. And that's just the summarized data. This is going to be a little bit hard to see. Um, except to point out, anything over 30%, I should clarify, that's in, the, uh, in your attachment, talks about what's, you know, what is affordable. Affordable housing is most typically defined as housing expenses that comprise no more than 30% of gross household income. So I'm just showing over 50%. You add in over 30% and that brings you, again, this is a little bit different number. This is the ACS data, American Community Survey. So kind of the census, um, kind of five-year average data. So we looked at a lot of different data sets. Uh, but you can see here, once you become a renter and you, we have adding 12%, 11%, 23% of renters in Eau Claire are um, part of that Alice group. So they're, they're spending more than 30% of their income on housing. Uh, you can see the, the owners too, we have about 10% of owners are spending, of homeowners are spending more uh, than 30% of their income. We looked at housing costs for owners, we looked at housing costs for renters. Again, it's hard to read this, apologize for that, but I just wanted to highlight some of these uh, numbers here. So. Folks with a with a mortgage, this is the majority of those in Eau Claire, forty seven percent, are spending a thousand to fifteen hundred per month on your mortgage. I can show the housing costs for renters as comparison. So the point of this is just to show, okay, well what's the majority? What are what are the areas that we need to focus on in terms of, you know, true housing costs? So any you know, majority of folks are looking at thousand to fifteen hundred is is the uh, essentially what uh, the average mortgage may be in, um, in Eau Claire. In fact, the median is at 1227. Seems fairly affordable, but like I showed with that Alice report, uh, many folks can only afford, you know, $735, less in some cases. Uh, here is the same figure for renters. Over 63% spend 500 to 1,000 for their uh, their monthly rent. 
But again, if we jump back to those, that Alice data, you know, we're looking at 500 to 700, maybe 800 per month. That's really an affordable kind of range. So, you know, that's that's in in this uh, in this range, and that's part of what we're we're looking at as this task force is. Okay, well, if 500 to 700 is that affordable range, how many of these 63 percent are spending you know, 700 to 1,000? You know, kind of that upper half of this of this uh, range here. Point being, we have some very generalized and blurry data. It's not very um, explicit in kind of what the real story is and what our, our needs may be. So we keep drilling down and working with groups such as uh, Cedar Corp uh, has been helpful in providing a lot of data. Uh, this is one of those snapshots here. Zoom in a little bit so you can see this. What this is showing are the different wage types uh, generally found throughout Eau Claire County, uh, what 30% uh, of their median income would be. It's kind of like, what is that threshold? You know, what kind of what is the maximum they should be spending based on that affordability equation? And that turns into what a monthly mortgage or rent would be. And if you're a homeowner, you know, what does that uh, maximum affordable loan look like? So based on that, kind of all the different types of uh, employment employment types in in the county, we looked at a monthly mortgage or rent of $900. So that speaks a little bit more to, you know, jumping back, okay, folks are spending 1000 to 1500 But according to this, it looks like maybe, you know, maybe the jobs around here are only allowing them to spend 900 per month. And the mortgage that they can afford is 123 Versus in, you know, doing the math, so all of a sudden, well, if folks are spending, on average, Twelve hundred twenty-seven per month, but jobs are only really doing the math, allowing them to afford nine hundred. You know, there's that gap there. So these are the things that we're still wrestling with and still trying to figure out. You know, how much does the income play into this? How much do the, you know, job types that we have here in the county play into this? Um, you know, the other costs that we need to really start drilling down into this more than just the housing side of things. So again, these are the types of information we've been looking at, such as again these uh, different wage numbers. You could obviously a you know, smaller firm, the less perhaps they're they're able to afford uh, additional employees. You know, larger firms, as you can imagine, can afford a higher wage typically because they have obviously larger uh, assets available to them. But again, this is just showing you kind of what some of these wage numbers look like. This 43,000 is in line with a lot of other data we were seeing that were showing, you know, 43, 42 at most, 45 plus as the uh, median wage in Eau Claire, whereas the statewide average is anywhere from 48,000 and up. Okay, red flag. We just saw that now that's truly showing us that income or wages is a real issue here. Perhaps uh, housing affordability may be in line with other communities. You know, the monthly rent, the monthly mortgage, the housing costs themselves are fairly comparable to other communities. But again, that affordability starts to become an issue because the wages are lower. To show a little bit more about that, zoom out here. This is going to be impossible to read, <laughs> but I'll try to explain it anyway. Hopefully, you can kind of see what I'm trying to show here. Uh, the orange bar is is uh, Eau Claire County, green is the state of Wisconsin, and blue is the U.S. And just showing what the different wage uh, kind of percentages of folks in different wage categories. So largest percentage, again nationally as well as here, is twenty five thousand to fifty thousand. What I you know just showed you know forty three thousand or so, you know plus or minus, but you know it's twenty five to fifty. Well. That's a big difference between making twenty-five thousand and fifty thousand. So these are the things we still have to kind of drill down a little bit more in detail. But the important part to look to look at again, this goes from high to low, is that look the orange bar are wages less than twenty-five thousand is above the state average and above the national average. And then on the higher end, uh, the higher wages are below the state average and below the national average. So that's an important point to make here is that this just further solidifies the picture that wages in Eau Claire County are on the lower end 
and trending away from what the state and the national averages are. Another thing we looked at, I like this. Again, this doesn't always tell us the, the best story, but at least it's trying to show a little bit more in terms of what does the housing inventory look like. Uh, the blue bar uh, shows um, number of households in a certain income bracket. So taking those different uh, wage groups that I just showed, put them vertically here with the blue bars in the county, Eau Claire County. And then orange shows um, housing inventory that would be affordable to those wage types. So that goes back to that other graph that showed, flip back here, sorry, <clears throat> back to here. You know, kind of wages and home, you know, what, a, what kind of loan could someone afford a certain wage type? So combining a lot of that and, and really stretching out a lot of the data, because this doesn't really necessarily tell the story of the rental side, it doesn't tell, again, it's, it's ranges. So it's not a complete story, but it's trying to, again, just show a picture that there's their inventory lacking in most of the wage groups, especially on the lower end. And that's what we've been identifying is that that's one of the, f I'll, I'll kind of walk through the, the summary as well. One of the f first consensus statements we identified was that the most acute need is for quality rental housing that is affordable for persons of low income. So again, this is inclusive of renters and homeowners and the homeowner, you know, the, the homes to purchase inventory. We can see this is that lower end of the, the spectrum of wages and what's available to, to to them and affordability side of things. And that's a real, obviously, a huge gap and a hole that we've identified. Kind of middle income, you know, middle price range housing, not saying there's an abundance or overabundance. You can see here there's a gap in inventory. But again, there's a lot more available in this, in this middle area for folks in these income brackets to afford. Again, it's, it's not one for one, and that's what we're trying to drill down on too, is to see what's the real housing of inventory need uh, in the area. Are we, ma are we meeting that? Uh, are, we, are we building too much? Are we building too little? You know, this doesn't, this is, doesn't tell the full picture, but, but it does say that kind of middle income is, is, uh, is, is seeming to find a spot to land. And these, er these uh, folks in the, these wage areas um, are not. <clears throat> a couple other things to point out just real quick. Uh, this is our latest number. It was just released last week, uh, showing the residential projects. Again, these are a lot of things that you've been a part of as well, through different plats and such. Uh, I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see a little bit better. We can see uh, 2018, 251 units were trending pretty well in terms of number of units being supplied. I had some other notes from uh, discussion last time, but again, it's it's almost one for one. It seems to be meeting. Uh, the need of our population growth. So in terms of, of, of units, we're, we're meeting that need, but obviously there's, there's still some, there are some missing parts that we, we need to drill down a little bit further into. So, okay, if we're meeting a need, but we still have a, a housing shortage in certain income air brackets, there's something, there's a mismatch somewhere. So we acknowledge that in, in the summary of the recommendations, and that's, uh, you know, something we need to, to keep investigating moving forward. Um, this is also somewhat telling. We talked about what kind of mortgage, you know, folks could afford at certain different, uh, you know, employment types. Uh, thankfully, the cost, average cost of a new single family home is starting to moderate a bit. But you can just see over the last, you know, just five to six years, it's just gone up almost exponentially compared to the previous 20 years, how it's been moderated pretty well. Again, we had a recession such in there, as you can see, um, actually a couple of recessions. But uh, point being, things are increasing still pretty dramatically. Even though we're moderating a bit, it's still one of some of the higher um, cost of a new single family uh, home that we've ever seen. Again, a lot of that has to do with labor, cost of materials, and cost of land. So costs keep going up, we therefore have to expect the, the sale prices to go up as well. So with that, just kind of snapshot some of the data that we're, we're trying to sift through, trying to uh, translate and 
understand a little bit better, but obviously a lot of questions yet, and I'll kind of talk about some of those things that we'll be working on here uh, over the next few months and such that will impact uh, the work that you're doing as well. So meeting three, we ended up having uh, November 1st, not superstitious, we did not necessarily specifically delay the meeting from Halloween, but um, it was immediately the next morning after that. Uh, so the third meeting, we, we started having these roundtable discussions in a little bit more detail. Uh, we talked about, you know, what are some of the, we did some polling, we did some surveying with the group um, prior to this and, and posed a few questions to, to the group uh, in these roundtable discussions. I won't read through all these, but we talked about zoning, we talked about, you know, other policies and incentives, talked about land assembly, you know, collaboration, uh, and so on and so forth. This is also when we started looking at these different sectors. We had these sector groups. Uh, again, we, we started distilling a lot of this information and identified the fact that, okay, we have, we have some pretty broad categories we need to, to get some additional information uh, from and different collaboration with. And that's where we ended up with the lived experience and support agencies, uh, builders and developers, uh, zoning and policy kind of discussion group, as well as the finance community. Uh, the fourth meeting ended up uh, kind of doing fine tuning and providing what you have here tonight. That was uh, in mid-December. Also want to mention, you may have heard of some of these other concurrent efforts. Dunn County, was uh, they held a housing forum in early October, uh, checked in with them a couple weeks ago, they haven't done a lot, uh, specifically as a large uh, forum like they did then to follow up on that. They've had individual groups do some follow-ups. Uh, there's this joint homelessness initiative that's still ongoing uh, with a consultant, Erin uh, Healy. She came in in October to do her initial work. That's through the Housing Authority and some outside partners as well. And as well as uh, Jonah, uh, they've had an affordable housing task force uh, moving forward to this image is from Erin uh, Healy. She's looking to do what they call an action lab cycle or a 100 day sprint, uh, really focus again on the homelessness uh, part of the equation. So with that, I uh, came up with this uh, draft summary recommendations. I, I kind of liken it to an executive summary. They might see in a larger report, which it will likely function as as we uh, finish up here with the overall report. Again, talk to these consensus statements. One of those, like I said, uh, really speaks to the data, which talks about, you know, looking at that need for rental housing uh, for those who are experiencing low income or very low income. We defined a, f uh, sorry, some other consensus statements I should mention that really speak to some of the work you're doing here as well. Um, uh, specifically looking at, like I mentioned, rising costs of other non-housing related uh, uh, services like health care, child care and such. And another thing too that uh, you know may come back and uh, have some discussion here later is to look at what uh, how to continue the efforts of this task force. You know how do we keep the momentum going? From there, again, to find affordable, as I mentioned, uh, no more than thirty percent gross household income. That's what the, Dal the Alice report uses. It's what a lot of uh, national studies use as kind of a benchmark. You know whether or not that's entirely accurate for every market, every community is uh, debatable, and that's one thing we struggled with for a little bit with the task force, but settled on that just for simplicity's sake at this point. <laughs> Ended up defining the uh, different housing segments. It was important to really identify the, the groups that we um, saw in that Alice report and other data. Uh, homeless and very low income, income insecure, and then middle income and income secure are those, again, more of that pale blue bar that I showed there outside that Alice range. Also identified, obviously, here in Eau Claire, students uh, being another cohort we need to look at, uh, seniors, and then people with disabilities, uh, we're out maybe expanding that, not just people with disabilities, but people with uh, other um, you know, stigmas. That was one thing that Dunn County identified as well, is uh, you know, rental stigma for those who with, uh, you know, were you know, previously incarcerated, things of that sort. So um, we've identified other, other groups that really are uh, having housing struggles as well. Uh, looked at income measures, meaning, you know, what are we actually measuring those different ranges? Some of them are translatable across different data sets, some are not. 
And then finally look at, uh, looked at the housing data itself and those are things we're gonna keep exploring to move forward. And finally, the uh, summary recommendations. So broke those down into five different categories and uh, really based on, I would say in order of importance, but really kind of in order of uh, the things that had the most conversation and most, um, I guess, uh, input to put forward here. And that also led into things that were probably the most, uh, I guess, um, tangible moving forward, things that could be more uh, easily identified and addressed. So those are development regulations, obviously things that are going to be <laughs> applicable here quite a bit, city policies, of course, as well, public funding, public-private partnerships, and then also the civic realm. So I'm not going to go through all those individually, but they're in your report, in this summary, sorry, in this summary, uh, it's like a seven-page summary. Development regulations are those that obviously will be most, uh, uh, I guess, uh, in your wheelhouse here looking at uh, zoning requirements, talking about you know, density issues, setbacks, lot sizes, allowable use, you know, other things we've already talked about, accessory dwelling units, tiny homes. So a number of things that uh, staff is gonna start uh, um, sorting and sifting, <laughs> and we'll be, be bringing back uh, to you at least to start as a discussion item uh, moving forward. But these are certainly things that uh, will um, have your review and input moving forward. Uh, city policies, again, um, a little bit more broad for those. Uh, and then other things that maybe are less applicable to the Planning Commission, public funding, public-private partnerships, and then kind of civic realm. So what is next? Next, again, task force conclusion this month, perhaps even next week. Uh, and then looking at uh, policy and ordinance revisions. So uh, that's going to start with what we've already identified as a two-year work plan, a draft one was presented to the uh, um, City Council last week in their work session. I'll talk a little bit about that here as we close out. Um, so two-year work plan, again, this is just, uh, I think, to help us really get our heads around so many different uh, components of those summary recommendations and, and what can we do um, more easily and in what kind of time frame. So short range being three to six months, mid range six to 12 months, and long range 12 to 24 months, or perhaps ongoing. I won't dwell on all of these, but uh, so these things are going to, like I said, land in your lap a little bit. Uh, short range three to six months, these are just some ideas. We wanna look at some targets and performance measures, you know, one of the things that we can measure to make sure we're actually making some progress. And then staff is putting together these implementation strategies, you're gonna like a citizen input group to keep this task force moving forward. I think another important piece, again, is just building the data set, inventory of what we already have, where some infill sites, and even doing a uh, housing inventory as well. Uh, resource packets were talked about, just information education. Uh, and then, again, evaluating things even such as fees, zoning regulations, affordable housing criteria, et cetera. Uh, Mid-range, uh, council approved some funding for what they're calling a smart, smart housing program, kind of a... Uh, a tenant landlord resource center or some support services. Uh, also education mediation efforts through that. A lot of other cities are providing that kind of information. Again, dealing with that stigma side of uh, those may maybe who are experiencing uh, lower income, homelessness, other issues. And uh, also, again, in terms of targets and performance measures, can we look at uh, encouraging and even improving one or more of the missing middle housing segments? Uh, especially related to some of those vulnerable uh, housing segments I just mentioned. Uh, this is in color, but I always like this drawing because this gives a real good, you know, picture of what is missing middle. You know, it's, I would say detached single-family homes. Well, that, that was what I just showed you in terms of that trend line for for uh, the prices related to that. But well, where do these other things fit in? You know, townhomes. You know, bungalow court, uh, triplexes, fourplexes, we're seeing more duplexes come in. But you know, I don't say it's easy to build an apartment, but you know, we get apartments that come in, we get single family detached, but it's all the things in between, how those get mixed in, that can address uh, you know, some of the housing costs, housing needs, and um, the, diff the, the changes that are going on 
with uh, even just the uh, family makeup in the country. And finally, uh, long range, 12 to 24 months, these are bigger picture things. Uh, I think an you know, overall goal is to reduce the number of cost burden to residents, both owners and renters, as we talked about. And obviously, uh, look at some other kind of larger scale things, such as even you know taking, taking on some uh, larger land assembly, much like what the RDA has uh, been successful doing. Lastly, last slide here, questions. Um, I just showed some images here from the planning side that many of you may be familiar with. Uh, American Planning Association, you've got your planning magazine. Uh, they have a housing initiative called Planning Home. Uh, they're starting to assemble, or they not starting, but they have been assembling a number of resources and trying to you know, be a real resource as they, they need to be uh, nationally to provide a lot of you know data, um, other codes and ordinances we can utilize, and uh, just kind of a you know information uh, resource uh, to uh, house a lot of that information for us. That was an intentional pun, just to see if you're awake. Okay. Anyway, apparently not. So, <laughs> um, and there there are some new policy guides. The uh, APA updates them every kind of like ten to twelve years or so. Uh, this one is about in that range, 10 to 12 years. Uh, I think 2006 is before the last big recession. They had a housing policy guide, so they're updating that right now. And as members, you can link to that. I'm happy to send it to you as well. Uh, they're taking, I think they're wrapping up their input right now uh, on that, but they're looking at uh, you know, any comments you might have on their housing policy guide. Again, that gives some information, like I said, just ideas for how to address uh, in specific areas to focus on as we look at, look at uh, implementing some new housing strategies. I mentioned Cedar Corporation, just uh, gonna shout out to them for providing a lot of uh, good data here pro bono. Uh, this is uh, Urban Land Institute, where uh, our office is also members of that, so if there's information you'd like from that group, we can certainly get that for you. Uh, one of those things that the group talked about, task force, was goes to, from NIMBY to YIMBY from not in my backyard to yes in my backyard. So again, a lot of good design and uh, uh, just uh, communication and collaboration really go a long way to make neighborhoods be more supportive and positive about those missing middle, kind of mixed housing types and uh, you know, uh, housing that is more affordable uh, for those who are in the lower income bracket at the moment. So again, yes, in my backyard, I just got this resource uh, like a week or two ago and uh, still going through it right now. But uh, again, a lot of good strategies, a lot of good information. I just wanted to highlight out there that it's accessible to plant commissioners. Uh, and any questions on that, we can certainly get some more of that pulled together for you as well. So sorry to go on a bit, but a um, lot to talk about over eight to nine months that we've been working on this. And uh, obviously a little bit more to go to finalize overall report and uh, just take the draft off of this uh, summary of recommendations. So see if there are any questions or comments you might have at the moment. Thank you. All right. Um, any questions on all this good stuff? Great. Wow. No super quiet tonight. So we'll, we'll come back and we'll have some more discussion items certainly over the next uh, a few meetings. And we'll, we'll pull out some of those individual uh, topics like we've talked about before, accessory dwelling units, um, tiny homes, uh, you know, other zoning regulations that uh, you know, we may want to look at uh, reviewing and revising moving forward. Yeah. Um, Scott, how much do you get into student housing to any great detail in not, this initiative? Not much, to be honest. Okay. I, and I, again, it's one of those, a lot of it's just a, a failure of the data, to be honest. Yeah. I know it's really, it's yeah. something that we, we started you know, drifting over into mm. the, into these other data sets that just yeah. were talking about home ownership and rental. And obviously in that rental component are going yeah. to be students, but um, ACS includes them if they want to be included. It's a voluntary kind of system. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're in, if you're in the dorms, that's institutional housing, so that doesn't count. You know, so it's it's a it's a kind of an odd mix based on what data you're looking at. But that's exactly one thing that we need to uh, drill down in, 
or on and, and figure out a little bit better what we have. Because it, it, it just appears to me that, you know, we've got student housing of all ranges here, and some of it, maybe substandard isn't the right mm -hmm. term, but I'll use it anyway. And uh, in some in some areas that if we could ever get a redevelopment into single family housing, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're desirable locations, not desirable properties, but yet they're providing uh, substantial income for the owners <clears throat> and probably then artificially inflated as to the value. Mm -hmm. And it seems like there's opportunities there. I'm just not, at least in my mind, it, the more the more housing, apartment housing projects we have, maybe the demand for some of those less desirable locations drops, and right. accordingly, maybe the uh, the prices drop accordingly. Or yeah, or increase in additional the institutional housing, you know, actually right. more dormitories and things yeah. of that sort. Absolutely. So, okay. and that too, it also speaks to the wage side of things that you talk about the uh, you know, these blue bars are you know, these are low to high in terms of wages, you know, how many of those are students? You know, where does that fit in? Right. And that's that's another question too, is that, you know, this may be overstated because of that. And the other thing too is, we, one of the things we've identified too is looking at um, housing desirability. I mean, that sounds like, well, we all want good housing. No, housing, in terms of, you know, how many of these are, are students or folks that want to be renters? You know, they don't want to have own a home. So you know, we're talking about you know housing inventory. So we're not sure exactly what is this gap is not necessarily this. It could be something much less than that. So those are the things that absolutely we still need to we don't have answers for, unfortunately, and we still need to keep asking those questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Allen, I was Yes, uh, at the city council presentation, you had some additional slides that I'm looking at from our packet uh, of info from that. But um, there was one slide that you showed that was that matches with what I have here, and that was the one on household survival budget for Eau Claire County, mm -hmm. um, where it shows the difference between like a single adult versus a, a family of four, essentially. Yeah, that one. I guess. <clears throat> interesting how it, how there's a lot of other costs um, especially looking at the four you know the family of four side of things and and how these interlate with each other I imagine is a big part of what Alice does mm -hmm. so I'm just wondering how you know some of our other planning efforts particularly with transportation can help you know alleviate some of these basic needs um, in terms of expenses and, tr and transportation is really pretty much equal with housing. Um, right, right. So for Eau Claire County, so um, I think each of them makes up roughly 15% of the budget. And so I guess, you know, coming back to the question of location of housing can be really a determinant of the cost of housing mm -hmm. because of the potential savings if you don't have to own a second vehicle or... Right or not, maybe not a vehicle at all if you're a student living mm -hmm. on Chippewa Street, for example. Um, so I guess I'm just trying to figure out how we can solve maybe both of those major areas of expense together or maybe at least reduce one of them to help find some money for the other. <laughs> um, and it seems like, you know, we've done, you know, planning efforts for transit and bike and pedestrian access, but... Um, I guess how can we have that fit in with affordable housing? I heard one of them that is mentioned frequently is how we can reduce the the parking requirements, mm -hmm. um, which you know if you have a a uh, apartment building that has underground parking, it could be thirty thousand dollars per space, right? And that suddenly is you know a large percentage of the cost of that unit. So mm -hmm. I guess I just wanted to raise that as a right. as a point is that there's such a similarity in costs from housing to transportation. And, and if you have a house in the right spot, you might not have to spend very much on transportation depending on where you work and what your needs are. So, yeah. um, 
or if the city has a good transit system or easy and safe bikeways. So. Very, very good point. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's something we need to start investigating further. Is that you know this group was tasked with kind of this line, you know, this row <laughs> of the whole <coughs> equation. Look at housing, <clears throat> but as this report indicates, and as the other data sets we identified, you know, really show us is that there's that's just one piece of the whole puzzle. There are others that, in fact, yeah, are the same or perhaps more in certain areas. You know, how can we address the transportation side? Uh, healthcare is one of the higher costs um, in Eau Claire County compared to other parts of the state. Even you know, with all of our access to hospitals and such, it's still a, a higher cost than elsewhere. Transportation, too, exactly, is a little bit higher than uh, other parts of the state as well. Uh, food is pretty well in line, but you know that too. It depends on, you know, perhaps where in the city you live. Are you in a food desert? You know, a lot of things that we we haven't really addressed through this housing task force are going to be things that you're know, addressed in the comprehensive plan and and other aspects of of development as things come forward. So, yeah, opportunity to ask a lot of questions as uh, we look at you know development regulations, comprehensive planning, things of that sort. But again, the the group was really tasked with this and really did open up a lot of other questions <laughs> to start asking as well. All right. Anybody else? Any other questions? This won't be your last chance to right. have comments. We'll be bringing back the uh, final report uh, as soon as that's available too, perhaps as early as next month. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Takes us to the Claremont Avenue study area, Mr. Preacher. Now that everyone's asleep, we're going to talk about Claremont Avenue. You know, I set the agenda, and I thought this item would go faster, but Mr. Allen did a great job. Uh, we did receive a request from 1106 Mandovi Road. You may remember this project a couple years back. They came forward with a site plan also known as Artisan Forge Studios. Um, currently located in a district that's known as C3H. Their property is located right here. With that property, it's currently zoned C3H, as I mentioned, 70-foot setback for the H over at the Highway Overlay District. Uh, they do have frontage along Highway 12. They also have frontage along Highway 37, which also carries that 70-foot setback. Claremont Avenue has a variation in land uses and setbacks throughout the city. Some have 50, some have 70, some have 30, some have 20-foot setbacks in the front. Some have frontage roads, some don't have frontage roads, some have uh, buildings, some don't have buildings, some have setbacks, some have signs. Uh, it's a variation throughout the whole city. This area in particular has seen, according to my math, 30 variances regarding setbacks. Uh, they range from Marshall Clinic, who got one in, in 2016. Caribou Coffee got one in 2016 as well. Uh, Artisan Forage got one in 2015. So looking at this entire area, there is a problem potentially. Uh, going forward... Um, like I mentioned, we did receive an, a zoning application to take it from C3H to a C3P, which would be planned development. They are looking for another building expansion in the front uh, for a patio area and also for a sign potentially. The purpose of the rezoning potentially would be to can make it more consistent throughout the corridor, not only for his property, but maybe for the entire, you know, from CVTC, UW, Eau Claire, all the way to the river, but then you go up, uh, a good example would be the Kmart site has a 70-foot setback. Again, that may or may not be appropriate, but for the redevelopment of that site, maybe a reduced setback would encourage more a walkable, more bikeable, more less dependent on a car potentially between the businesses. Uh, with the Shopco Plaza into foreclosure, potentially Shopco closing, uh, Gordy's Market probably closing, this entire area may be changing faster than what the setbacks would allow. Uh, we have 
potential problems with the setbacks throughout this entire corridor. Those are just a couple examples that came to mind. Again, I went over, we reached out to WISDOT and the city engineering department. Neither of them have concerns. Now the setback is measured from the property line to the front structure. That does not incorporate where the curb line is. The curb line could be another 30 to 40 feet back. So these structures currently are about 100 and, uh, I have an aerial, about 110 feet off, in particular along this block. This is showing the 70 foot setback, the property line, and then the curb lines up here. So before you, uh, the staff would prefer a more comprehensive study of the corridor prior to scheduling the rezoning of this property in particular. Um, again, that, that corridor runs from Claremont and 37. Hastings Way has a few of them, but right now we're just particularly looking at Claremont Avenue. Staff would like to discuss the rezoning with the Planning Commission prior to scheduling it. Now we are under a time frame to schedule that rezoning and have the council act on that item. But the Planning Commission, if we do go with a plan development ordinance, can ask for more landscaping, reduction in signage, Reduction in parking requirements, reduction in anything really with the plan development ordinance. Uh, staff believes we have a problem. Uh, it is a, a difficult problem to address, and I don't. We don't know the right answer. Uh, the applicant, in his narrative, is so, is recommending a 20 foot setback. We don't know if that's appropriate. Potentially, would be appropriate. Um, it just depends on how the plan commission feels, and then ultimately the city council would review all rezoning requests along Claremont or 37 or anywhere else for that matter. Uh, so we're just looking for some kind of direction before we take this application forward. We could do this entire block, from, which incorporates the Clarendon, the Green Mill, the Atrium Building, uh, the current uh, studio, uh, Wisconsin, and then there's another office building. We could do that, or we could look at it more broad and do Shopco Plaza and Shopco and the outlots in front of that. It all depends on what the plan commission would prefer uh, going forward. So we're just looking for some direction. Uh, with that, be happy to open it up. Thank you. Do we, any comments, questions? But Ryan, I guess uh, for I mean, what, what's the purpose of a setback? How do how do why is it, why does that sure. exist? Right? So before now I'm going to date Mr. Ivory and Mr. Uh, Daryl Tufty, but that was placed there before they even started, and, and uh, Daryl and Pat have been here longer than I've been alive, but I better watch myself. Uh, it's been in place for many years. Uh, we believe that was for potential uh, future right-of-way ex uh, expansion so they could have another lane. Talking with WISDOT and the City Engineers Department, we don't believe Claremont Avenue would ever be eight lanes again, or expanding it any farther. Um, we're not 100% sure why the frontage roads have the setbacks at 70 feet. That doesn't completely make sense to the planning staff. Um, the setback would be for road safety, traffic safety, um, signage, building, but then you're putting the parking lot in front usually, and then your building is about 70 feet back from the property line. And so mostly just for traffic safety and speed safety along that corridor. See this being like a downtown where road buildings are going to be on Claremont and parking lots behind. No, it. no. But even if you reduce it down to say a twenty foot setback, that just means the building could be placed at twenty foot setback. Not necessarily saying it would be. That's building. You could put a sign in there. You could put green space. Correct. Yep. Uh, and the plan commission may could require uh, more green space along the corridor, especially in the front yard. That would that would provide that buffer. Uh, you could require a sign to be like caribou sign where it's only, you know, 20 feet in overall height and, you know, 100 square feet instead of 40 feet in height and 200 square feet. So it's really up to the commission to decide what is the most appropriate way to handle this corridor in particular. Yeah, Craig. Uh, Mr. Petrie, going further east on Claremont, it, where the true value plaza is, What's the setback there? It depends. <laughs> well, no, yeah, that's setback it, it 50. looks pretty uniform, at Correct. least along that strip center. Correct. That's 50 foot. I believe. That's 50 foot. Correct. Why is that 
acceptable and now we're going further down and we're looking at various I mean to my untrained eye that looks like a good setback uh, a reasonable setback sure um, I guess my comment uh, we've got to get some consistency here it seems yeah, yeah definitely um, I did highlight the setback so all these buildings are in line currently now the property owner would prefer to encroach this setback towards the north with a covered patio, uh, adding a sign, and other things potentially. Is that appropriate for this location? He is, doesn't have a frontage road. He is significantly far off of Claremont Avenue, about 110 feet approximately. So what would be appropriate setback is, is the question. <laughs> Speaking from a former highway engineer's aspect, one of the reasons setbacks are there is it's a whole lot cheaper buying open land than it is buildings, even though the land itself can be expensive. And as the DOT has indicated, they're probably not going to expand Claremont Avenue to eight lanes. I don't see it myself either. But I, in getting back to what Craig was saying, I think if we're going to look at this area, we probably should look from the Chipper River maybe all the way to Altoona city limits on West Claremont. Mm -hmm. And if we want to go north of the Chipper River, I'll look at that yep. in conjunction with it or at a later date, realizing I think DOT has enough right away north of where Claremont goes to four lanes that they can expand it to six lanes. Yes, they do at this time now, and, if they ever I, wanted to. Yep, that's correct. And I know if they'd have known that uh, Hutchinson was going in immediately as it did. They probably would have built six lanes initially up there because that caught us with our pants down, so to speak, Yeah, when that traffic went in. So, but I would think we should look at the whole Claremont corridor <laughs> as opposed to piecemeals. So what would be a potential appropriate setback, Mr. Peterson, for, for that corridor? Well... I hate to put you on the spot, but... I'm thinking in somewhere between 20 and 50 feet. Um, they're not going to need any more right away for Claremont. Um, I know DOT is moving away from frontage roads, and I'll use a term Jeff Abbott at DOT <coughs> hated me using, but backage roads or internal street systems. They did it up at Prairie, Prairie Road where McDonald's and in, in Chippewa. Mm -hmm. Where McDonald's and Pizza Hut are, they went with a, an internal street system, took out that frontage road. There are accidents waiting to happen, but with businesses, face, they like to face the highway, therefore they like to face a frontage road. But I don't see any more frontage roads going in here. I don't see Claremont expanding, so I think um, 2025 to 50 feet would be in order, and maybe in the 2025 foot range. Do you have that zoning map, Brian? Yes. Yeah, I think it's de yeah, definitely worth looking at the corridor. We were talking about that as well, is how far do you look at this? And you can see here, too, that the zoning is starts to vary quite mm -hmm. a bit the further east you get because of the older part of the, the uh, development happens across the street. You yep. have zoning clusters on any one of our arteries where it changes from one zoning to another. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's it should be eliminated. Correct. I, th well, I think what we're looking at would be would, would be to look at the C3H in particular zoning and come up with a consensus of what setback that should be. And I also know that the Kmart site is C3H, I believe. So that would be another appropriate site to reduce it down. That doesn't have a frontage road, but uh, it does have that 70-foot setback on it. And the True Value, yeah, that strip yeah, center, that's C2. That's example. C2, yeah. yep. So there's some variation there that we yep. have to look at as well. Yep. And I think when we look at setbacks, since we're going to reduce it down, I would look at how restrictive are we going to be in that setback. Will we even allow parking in the set? Let's say it goes down to 20. Are we even going to allow parking in there? Are we going to allow signing? Because we do have the trail, the, the ped bike trail on the north side. Uh -huh. Is there going to be a need or a desire to have one on the south side? And if you've got parking and signs sitting in there, 
it's going to get expensive. That is correct. You know, to put it in. Mm -hmm. So, I think I don't know if there's enough right away on the south side for. I think they have. Any I believe it's sidewalk if needed. Yeah, right now it's a thirty foot from the back of the curb. Depending on how wide the trail is and how far off the back of, from the back is, of the curb is it the, is. Is the right away? Yes, sir. At this time. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not sure how wide the trail would be and how far away from the curb line it would be. Well, I'd like to keep it away just yep. for their safety's sake. Mm -hmm. I know we've had one death there, I think, on the north side. So I think I, I think we should look all the way from at least the Chipper River to the Altoona city limits, both north and south, and, and not only look at the distance for the setback, but what should be allowed in there too. And some of these buildings are going to be here for another 50 or 100 years. Others, there may be redevelopment, and those are the ones that are going to get addressed by the new setback. So. That's correct. Thank you. Um, when I think about it, uh, 20 feet seems pretty slim, and I, this, I don't have any science to back it up, but. I guess if I was going to come up with a, a consistent number, I would be in like the 30 foot range. Just my two cents. Sure. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, how close is the Mayo Clinic, the one right next to the care? Would you call? That seems like it's. That one's, that one's 70 as well. Yes, they got a variance for the sign. No, they didn't get a variance for the sign. So their sign's at 70 as well. Oh, uh, Jeremy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Petrie, I was wondering, I know this is before your time and maybe uh, Mr. Ivory would actually be able to help, but the uh, there's the Claremont Avenue Medical and Educational District Plan. I think that's almost 10 years old now. That is correct. And um, so I'm trying to figure out what this really says about this topic, and it doesn't say much, and I'm kind of surprised because it's, it's really a long plan, and if it doesn't say it's 61 pages, <laughs> correct, it doesn't really mention very much at all about setbacks. And I'm wondering if there's a lot of other things it does mention that could help us make this decision. So has that sure. plan been reviewed in order I have, to? Yeah, uh, staff did look at that. Um, it is a large document. Uh, it doesn't really talk about setbacks in particular. It talks about the district. Talks about making it potentially more walkable and bikeable, which there is a trail on the north side. Potent, uh, trail just went in off the frontage road on the south side, potentially would be connecting. Um, but that plan didn't really look at, it did look at a uh, network of roads within the medical district to the north side and potentially the roundabout and that was put in at that, but it didn't really talk about redevelopment or new development or setbacks in particular along Claremont. So that doesn't really help too much with this plan um, but there is that plan is out there it's about 10 years old now okay just as a follow-up to that I guess I would say that there would that it, it does seem we need to be very careful to make sure we have room to add in the additional bike and pedestrian connectivity that that plan was largely about and then we have been moving forward with with highway 37 and mm -hmm. the frontage road redevelopment so um, so it seems like somewhere around 30 feet would be more comfortable for me as well. I, I agree with both Jeremy and, and Mr. Seymour. I think the, the, the 20 might be an, uh, uh, an absolute minimum setback and extremely limited you know, as to what can go in there. No parking, maybe no signs, and then go to 30 or 50 feet for buildings but maybe have a two-tiered system, one for buildings and one for Could other amenities to sure. buildings. Could do it that way, yep. Because mm -hmm. 20 is a little close for mm -hmm. a building sure. to be to Claremont, so. Great. The, the buildings with no frontage road are consistently using a 60-foot boundary for double parking and drive lane. Mm -hmm. Each car length is 20 feet and each drive lane is 12, so you're getting 64 feet Every one of these buildings is using the bank, the, the Gardasen Forge right now, their neighbors are all using an area as a double path and as a double double loaded parking lot. 
Uh, since that's the consistent use, I think it's also important to keep that in mind that where there is not a frontage road, the parcels are using that as double-sided parking almost universally all the way down from one to the other. Mm -hmm. And to say, oh, well, they, they, somebody can just go to a 20-foot setback and put some kiosks and stuff out there, I think it's, it's um, inconsistent with the, the prior use. Essentially a 50 or 60 foot setback. 60, 60 yeah. would fit what they are t consistently using and that doesn't include any any kind of a buffer for plantings or streetscape. Uh -huh. so I would think that actually the 75 along there still is actually very appropriate for the variety of uses and the interest we have in a um, greenscape of the city. Um. And we don't have anything that's actionable tonight, right, Ryan? No, this application will be on April 1st. Um, it will be for three C3H to C3P uh, with a reduction in setback, but we're not 100% sure what setback they're going to propose at this time. Any other comments, questions? All right, I'm not seeing any. Anything from us, Ryan, or is that good enough feedback for now? For now. I think that's good. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, uh, code compliance items, then, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Ready with code compliance items. Future agenda items. Um, additions or corrections to the minutes. I do. Oh, sorry. Yeah, one more. I do have one for the uh, future agenda items. Actually, two quick things. Uh, one is uh, short-term rentals. We've talked about that briefly, so that uh, we'll have that as another discussion mm -hmm. item coming up here uh, soon as well. So, uh, been working with and talking with uh, uh, staff at uh, Visit Eau Claire. They have interest in that as well. So, we, we've talked about Airbnbs, had some good issues, permits and such. We're trying to <coughs> uh, match up as well with uh, Eau Claire County in their licensing process. They just updated too. So. Just FYI, that'll be another discussion item, uh, somewhat related, but uh, a little bit separate from the affordable housing discussion. But uh, and the other thing too, I do want to make mention, Mr. Chair, that uh, this Thursday and Friday, we'll be uh, kicking off our winter mission project. Uh, or as our friends from 880 Cities, you probably saw my pen flashing up there. Uh, pointing at stuff, but uh, 880 cities that they, they focus on again creating cities that are uh, accessible and healthy for folks from ages 8 to 80. So they are, uh, were the one working with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who we had a, a technical assistance grant for uh, the Invest Health Project. Again, you may have, have heard, and actually we presented last week at uh, City Council of uh, City of Eau Claire is a uh, or Eau Claire is a Winter City Vanguard. We're one of three that won this award. We're in the mid-sized city group. So the small city was Leadville, Colorado. We're the mid-sized city, and the large city is Buffalo, New York. So uh, a delegate, myself included, uh, delegation I should say, went to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, end of January and uh, went to the Winter Cities Shake-Up Conference and learned a lot about how to take the energy and excitement that we have in the summer and apply it to winter. I was not expecting it to, to apply it to the snowiest winter ever <laughs> right away. And uh, I was talking with Mr. Solberg before the meeting and um, I didn't realize that we signed up to become a winter city forever, but uh, apparently that might be what's happening. We are now and forever a winter city. But uh, anyway, the, all that kind of joking aside with that, um, it's exciting to move forward and, and look at taking all that energy and excitement that we really uh, promote and, and attract uh, to Eau Claire into the winter environment. So we're going to be doing some of that Thursday night, uh, extended version of uh, Winter After Hours, Piners Park, and uh, that normally ends in February, but coincidentally, again, maybe we just had the good fortune, as it were, to have so much snow that we're extending winter after hours into March. So uh, in part to really kick off this winter mission project. And then Friday night, uh, everyone's invited to 
I think it's at six o'clock. Uh, I'll be kicking off uh, at kind of the what's what is open and available at um, Haymarket Plaza <coughs> with Visit Eau Claire. Uh, we'll be kind of kicking off a little bit of a community uh, event um, again Friday night at six. So hopefully you're able to attend. Again, try to be winter positive. I keep pr promoting that around the office, around the community. <clears throat> again, trying to be uh, positive about what we do have here as resources uh, during the winter. But uh, I'm not entirely convinced this is my first winter back in 15 years. I, I'm, I've been told that winter will end, but I'm <coughs> not entirely convinced yet. So we'll see what happens here Thursday and Friday night. I don't want to take up too much more time, but uh, yeah, come out to Pinos Park Thursday night and downtown uh, to visit Eau Claire Friday night and uh, see what's going on with this winter mission project. You'll be hearing more about it. It's a two-year project, looking at some pilot projects moving on. But this is kind of a big kickoff. So. Sounds like fun. All right, Thanks. thank you. Um, anybody else? Future agenda? All right, I guess. Uh, oh, um, additions or corrections to the minutes? Anybody? Yes, Terry. Just a question. At the city council meeting following this, do you know if the, uh, the Wilson Square people and their neighbors came to an agreement? Oh, uh, pretty good question. Uh, yes, they did. Okay. Uh, they were able to do that. Uh, I believe it may have even been the day of or the afternoon of the, the meeting, but uh, the attorney or uh, other representative for the neighbor uh, did actually speak in support um, and did acknowledge that. So, yes. So, yes. Very good question. They, that was uh, positively resolved. All right. We're adjourned. Thanks, everybody. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and the City of Eau Claire. A transcript of this meeting is available for the hearing impaired. It will be available within seven days of this telecast. Call 715-839-4912 or TDD 715-839-1689 or write Eau Claire City Clerk, PO Box 5148 Eau Claire, Wisconsin, 54702-5148. NewsWorks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org.